but we try to go beyond this idea of what is inside and what is outside the construction site and instead to try and connect broader global political economy dynamic and broader labor market dynamics with what happens on a daily basis. And so we try to show how the workplace dynamics of the construction site are shaped by relations across multiple scales. It does, I think, make it challenging when you come with certain expectations and you know expect locals to work like Chinese people or expect kind of the same commitment, so to speak. Integrating this kind of local stakeholdership more and being able to setting up something where there's more skills transfer and better communication will probably end up saving time in the short term by, by just avoiding kind of labor disputes and, and local community disputes, which we've also seen is a big problem on Chinese work sites. But in the slightly longer term, it will have political payoff, particularly if that site, that work site happens to be in some kind of voting community where you can demonstrate, you know, for example, local employment benefits. Let me put you in the role of president or prime minister of a country in Africa. Your legislature has given you money now to build a port, a railroad, something, okay? You have two years to get it done. So the Chinese will come up with a bid that says, we will get it done in a year and a half. We will bring in our own suppliers. We will bring in our own managerial talent. We'll work with brokers to get local labor and bam, we're done, right? Or do you hire local firms that may not have had as much experience building large-scale infrastructure the way the Chinese have, but you're contributing to your local economy more. You are diverting those funds domestically and not to foreign suppliers like the Chinese. Your political future in many respects is on the line, depending on whether or not you can deliver this big piece of infrastructure. Okay, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you do? The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China-Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by CGSP's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, who, as always, joins us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today is going to be very interesting. We're going to talk about one of the themes of the China-Africa relationship that literally dates back to the early 2000s and really kind of set the stage for so much of what we talk about today in the China-Africa relationship. That's construction and labor and the intersection between those two. And it's interesting for you and I, who've been doing this show now for 14 years, to think back about how prominent those two issues have been in the discussions about the Chinese in Africa. In fact, I was just looking at some comments from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on his last trip to Africa last year. And sure enough, he brought it up about the question of imported labor coming into Africa. He talked about poor working conditions for both Chinese and for Africans. And again, he didn't say the Chinese by name, but you knew who he was talking about. And so many of those, again, those themes and those memes were set in the early 2000s and have proven to be very, very durable. And while the West has used these as weapons in many ways to criticize the Chinese. Africans have developed their own narratives about labor relations with the Chinese, oftentimes deeply rooted in their relationships with uh, previous colonial powers. And at the same time, the Chinese themselves have also portrayed this sense of win-win framed around labor. Kobus, I was sharing some political cartoons with you earlier today in preparation for the show, and it shows an African worker and a Chinese worker arm in arm embracing infrastructure development. And I think what you and I have seen over these years is it isn't quite that simple. Yeah, it's definitely not as simple as these cartoons, which frequently, we should be clear, these are cartoons that usually appear in, in publications like China Daily. So they portray a really egalitarian relationship. The kind of Western critics frequently, they stick to a very outdated view of a lot of Chinese workers being kind of imported into Africa and taking away African jobs. The reality, as we'll discuss today, in a lot of ways, kind of somewhere in between, not nearly as happily egalitarian as the propaganda shows, a lot more 
embedded in local practices more, much more than than Western critics would would acknowledge, but at the same time, really problematic in lots of lots of different ways, and in lots of ways, kind of reminiscent of older kind of labor problems in the African construction world. And there's some real deep cultural misunderstandings that often exist in the China Africa perceptions about labor. And when I was living in Kinshasa many years ago, I remember there was the meme back then that was circulating that China was importing prisoners into Africa to work on construction sites. And I would go and talk to project managers and I would ask them, I said, do you, do you have any prisoners? Is that something that's actually done? And they, they laughed and they said, no, of course, that's ridiculous because, I mean, the cost of bringing prisoners over from China to Africa is ridiculous and they don't want to work very hard. And they said, no, that's absurd. And okay, so I kind of let that go. And then I'm walking by a construction site and you see all of these walls around the site. And you think to yourself, well, that, that's kind of interesting. Okay. And then oftentimes they have little semi-like guard towers and they'll put barbed wire around it. And then the Chinese will oftentimes have their workers wear uniforms and the Chinese will also shave their heads. Chinese workers commonly do this and they do a lot of exercises and then they work seven days a week oftentimes because they're under enormous pressure to deliver projects. And so no wonder the perception is that, well, of course, These are prisoners because who else would do that? And it's interesting when you talk to Chinese project managers on these construction sites, they'll tell you that, no, the walls are there not to keep people in, but to make sure that people don't steal our equipment and to keep from the outside from breaking in. Of course, the way that they do the exercises, that's a thing that they do in lots of Asian countries. Here in Vietnam, workers also do exercises in the morning in Korea as well. So these are common cultural things that are oftentimes misperceived by people in other cultures. We're going to talk about that intersection between culture, labor, and construction today. There's a fascinating new book that just came out, Africa's Global Infrastructures, South-South Transformations in Practice. It's edited by I, I want to make sure I give them credit, but I, I'm afraid that I'm going to hack their names. But Yana Honke, Eric Cezanne, and Ifan Yang want to give them credit for editing it. We're going to focus today on Chapter 7 in the book that focuses specifically on construction and labor. And it was written by Mandira Bagwadin, who's a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, and Elisa Gambino, who's a Hallsworth Fellow in Political Economy at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Mandira, Elisa, welcome back to the show and congratulations on this fascinating chapter. Thank you so much. Thanks. Again, we want to start our conversation at this higher level before we get into some of the research that you did to put this together. Let's just talk about those misperceptions that I mentioned in my experience and what I saw in Kinshasa. Those were themes that came up. Now, some of these misperceptions are, again, misunderstandings. But as you found in your research, there are some real hierarchical, uh, there are real structural differences between the Chinese and their local African employees, particularly in countries like Kenya, where you did your research, Elisa, at the port of Lamu. So let's just start with both of you giving us a high-level introduction to what your chapter and what your research found in terms of the broad trends of China-Africa labor relations in the construction sector. Elisa, let's start with you, and then Mandira, I'd love to hear your opening remarks. Thank you so much, and thanks for having us. Um, I think what I find perhaps the most interesting about the Lamu Parst project is that this is a project that is financed by the Kenyan government. Um, not by Chinese sources. And that's why I started studying it in the first place, because I was really interested in figuring out whether some of the broader dynamics that are discussed when it comes to Chinese finance infrastructure would also resonate in projects that are not effectively financed by China, but that are co only constructed by Chinese companies that have won tenders. Um, to try and see whether some of the dynamics in terms of labor, but also managerial practices, as well as hierarchies within a deconstruction site are reproduced, or whether they're more influenced by uh, market lab labor markets in the context where they are. And so in the chapter, what we do is first we try and make a point for construction sites to be studied in close connection to the dynamics that they're embedded in, 
uh, social relations, labor market, but also broader political economies, both from the Chinese side, but also in this case from the Kenyan side. And we focus on the practice of living at work, which you were just talking about. So this idea that, well, not an idea, it's the fact that workers are living within the place where they work in little houses or temporary accommodation that are within the perimeter of the construction site. And we try to operationalize this idea by looking at the spatial, material, and social dynamics that characterize this uh, Sino African workplace at uh, this construction site. And we find that there is uh, definitely a boundary that is very clear, very demarcated what is inside, what is outside, who is inside and outside. Um, this is particularly evident in Lano uh, because of the contextual situation in which there is a lot of terrorist activity that is very close to Somalia. And so this is a very guarded boundary as well. It's very difficult to reach the construction site by road. And when I conducted my research there, it, I could only access it by boat uh, directly from Lano. But we try to go beyond this idea of what is inside and what is outside the construction site and instead to try and connect broader global political economy dynamic and broader labor market dynamics with what happens on a daily basis within the construction sites. And so we try to show how the workplace dynamics of the construction site are shaped by relations across multiple scales. So for example, we look at uh, ethno-technical hierarchy that perhaps Mandira can speak to a little bit. We look at how the space is organized and also the movements of workers, whether they have access to spaces reciprocally, uh, but we also look at daily interactions such, uh, centered around food, around commuting, as well as around brokering uh, labor controversies, which are very frequent in the construction sites. I think Chinese companies, especially the kind of construction, I'd also go far to say mining companies, have this reputation of building these like kind of gated enclaves, so to speak, either residential kind of corporate enclaves. And they kind of have their own kind of, you know, government or governance type of models and the way of doing things that is rather detached from the society in which they, they operate and the kind of local economies in which they operate. And so I think, as you mentioned, you know, Chinese construction sites and um, all these Chinese enclaves have been of lo uh, of, have been for quite a while a lot of kind of interest and especially, you know, in terms of looking at how Chinese labor practices and labor governance is kind of exported to the continent or absorbed in local communities. And I, Ellie, I think, pointed out that I should maybe just touch on what we found that was quite prevalent in this case was the practice of kind of ethno-technical hierarchy. And this is essentially looking at how powers and uh, privileges are unequally distributed by, in this case, we could say Chinese kind of management and Chinese workers versus uh, local Kenyan employees, both at the kind of skilled and unskilled level. And what Ellie found was that in terms of her field research, this extended to things around like, you know, who has access to things like gym equipment, kind of the standard of accommodation as well. I think she could possibly go into that a bit more. Ellie, would you want to jump in? Yeah, happily. I think one of the most interesting things that perhaps has been overlooked uh, by some of the literature on construction sites uh, or broadly labor relations is this idea that the Chinese workers are kind of a homogeneous group, right? And they benefit equally from some of the labor conditions within the construction sites. But one of the things that was very clear uh, living in the construction sites is there is also a hierarchy among Chinese workers. So managers enjoy much better housing, brick-walled housing, uh, air conditioning, single rooms and private bathrooms, while unskilled Chinese labor is in temporary accommodations, they're sharing rooms, they're sharing uh, sanitary facilities as well. 
But then the conditions of Kenyan workers living accommodations are completely different and they are sharing with many people. There's no air conditioning. The sanitary facilities are also shared with much more many people than the Chinese unskilled laborers. And there is a non-reciprocal access to these spaces. So Chinese managers and foremen can just walk freely across the entire camp, while Kenyan workers can only walk up to a certain point and they cannot enter the Chinese accommodation areas. So there's quite, a, you know, there's both a hierarchical managerial structure, but there's also one that is based on more of an ethnic base, as well as the sort of level of management within the company itself. So, you know, Mandira and also Elisa, feel free to jump in. Just to put this in a broader context, how different is this from other transnationally kind of driven infrastructure work sites in Africa? You know, kind of how special are the Chinese sites in setting up these boundaries and, you know, maintaining these kind of relationships? And to which extent is that kind of par for the course when you're a transnational construction company working in a country like Kenya? Yeah, I would say there's not much Chinese about it. It's quite a common practice in the construction industry worldwide that people live inside the construction site, especially in large projects that also have a stake in, you know, key development agendas or national security related infrastructure. So this is a very, very common practice in the construction industry worldwide. And it's particularly prominent in across global South context as well, uh, the living at work. I think there's some particularities in terms of the history that living at work has within uh, China's political economy. It traces back to planned economy, the Dunway system. So there's a continuity and a continuum there. However, the sort of living and working uh, in the same place, sorry, working and living in the same place, in, for example, a Kenyan tea farm under colonial rule or mines in South Africa doing apartheid were quite similar in terms of the organization of space as well. Mandira, there is a perception, again, not entirely sure if it's accurate or not, and it'd be interesting to get your take on this, that working for Chinese companies, not just in Africa, but this is a perception in other regions as well, is quite difficult, and that a lot of the Chinese managers are tough. There is a lot of frustration on the part of Chinese managers that they feel that they can't get their workers to work hard enough on WeChat, in many of the posts that that you see about managing Africans in particular, there is a theme of, well, Africans are lazy and they don't want to work extra and they don't want to eat bitter and put that extra effort the same way we Chinese want to do it. This is the memes that they have. At the same time, you've talked about in your paper about the segregation that exists within these work sites where the Chinese will oftentimes have separate eating quarters, sleeping quarters, even their transportation to work sites is different where Chinese will, managers will go in cars and oftentimes local workers either have to take buses, bikes, or walk. And they also live in a very precarious relationship with their Chinese managers that if there's any infraction, uh, they can be terminated or fired. And so there's a stress that exists there. Do you know how much of this is brought over from China? Transported is the word that you guys use in your article. And how much of this is just the nature of working in construction in Africa today? Thanks, Eric. That's a very interesting question. It's, I think well documented and well reported, you know, Chinese kind of work ethic and kind of work culture is, you know, almost this putting yourself through hardships and enduring kind of long working hours and working to deliver projects really quickly and really fast. And that doesn't necessarily translate to every every country or kind of every society where we often aren't kind of, I would say, workhorses, so to speak. And I think that that does prove, especially I think if you come from a society, a culture that's not uh, kind of set up around work or working extremely hard like the Chinese do, it, it can be a bit challenging, especially when you are kind of strapped for jobs. And if your only kind of job opportunities to get work at a Chinese construction company, you'd have to adjust to kind of the, their standards and norms around work. And I think that could be a bit challenging, especially when you consider cultural and linguistic differences. And 
I think it is difficult for African laborers to adjust to Chinese standards and ways of doing things. But also, I think Chinese people, especially a lot of the laborers or kind of engineers that come to Africa, as we outline in the chapter, kind of uh, eating bitterness in a way and like moving away from home, trying to build up their careers to kind of almost eventually make their way back to higher level paying jobs in China as such. So I think both are kind of enduring hardships, but at different levels. And it does, I think, make it challenging when you've got, when you come with certain expectations and, you know, expect locals to work like Chinese people or expect kind of the same commitment, so to speak. And we talk in the in the in the chapter about having kind of brokers and to within the within the construction site that try to kind of navigate these complexities and challenges between the local laborers and the kind of more ch- the Chinese managers. Ellie, uh, you know, was lucky enough in her fieldwork to observe these interactions and how vital these brokers are in helping the locals kind of, you know, keep their jobs, navigate language barriers and things, and as well as navigate things around like salaries, uh, wages and things. So it is definitely quite a kind of complex landscape. But somehow, you know, even with these this kind of hierarchical nature, the cog moves, so to speak. Yeah, things get done. I mean, yeah. railroads are built, yeah. roads are built, hospitals are built. It's remarkable. Copus, we saw that when we interviewed the directors of the movie Eat Bitter, how difficult it was for the managers to overcome the cultural and linguistic barriers that Mandira is talking about. But at the end of the day, buildings actually still went up. And that was always very impressive to me. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's, um, you know, because for all of the bad things one can say about these labor relations, they also are extremely challenging to the people involved, you know, kind of also in, including the managers. So it really is amazing. Elisa, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what you saw on the site when you saw these labor brokers in action. Like, who are they? What do they do? How do they do their jobs? Yes, absolutely. So they these are usually... Kenyans who are employed as supervisors. They are ra- they're not supervising people, they're supervising part of construction. So they are slightly higher in the managerial scale than uh, an unskilled laborer that's, for example, poor in cement. However, they're not technically supervising people, they're supervising bits of the construction. And they, uh, some of them uh, fall into this role of brokers almost by chance because they're often in close communication with Chinese farming and Chinese engineers. Chinese engineers often do speak a bit of English. Some of them speak really good English. They're generally quite young, around like 26, 28 year old. Why the foremen are usually men in their 40s, late 40s, and they often don't really speak much English at, or English at all. And so these brokers almost emerge out of necessity and out of circumstance. So, for example, in the construction site, the way that Lanoport was set up as I was there, it was the construction was ongoing 24 hours a day because there had been some delay. So the night shift is the one that I didn't observe. I wasn't observing night shifts. But what happened during the night shift is usually there was some washing with water pumps to wash the construction site and prepare it for the next day. And in the morning, because of the washing process, there would be a lot of issues. Some bits had detached, things needed to be fixed. And in the early morning, around 6, 7 a.m., that's when a lot of the labor controversies emerged. And I remember very starkly one morning I got to the construction area with uh, the person that I was shadowing, which was this broker in the chapter we call him Bonnie. And I arrived with him and suddenly there's a lot of screaming, someone's getting fired uh, because one part of the job that he did, uh, he had done the day before, had been washed away during the pumpkin, wash pumpkin process. And the uh, Chinese manager uh, in the, who is screaming at him to work faster, redo the job, is trying to just tell them to go home after they finish redoing the job and he's getting fired. And so Bonnie intervenes and he tries to take the Chinese manager aside. They have somewhat of a conversation, which is half gestures rather than a proper interaction. And later on, one of the engineers arrives and Bonnie is kind of in between the engineer and the Chinese farmer who was 
firing this person and tries to negotiate a way around it. And so instead of firing the worker to suspend them for the day and then perhaps have them join another team. And the engineer is listening to the Chinese fireman's perspective, is listening to Bonnie, but you could tell from this interaction that he was just trying to get the worker away from this situation, move them somewhere else, and just have them start their normal work routine you know, the next day in another team, to kind of move them away from the problem instead of terminating their employment. When these type of interactions take place, it's quite chaotic, right? So there's lots of noise, the dredger is dying, it's just a very, very busy environment. And so there's, you know, the screaming is not just to scream, it's mainly because you, know, you cannot be heard because of the noise that's around it, right? But these interactions take place very quickly. And interestingly, Bonnie's role is not just that of mediation, but it's also that of almost scolding some of the workers. So after this interaction with the Chinese engineer, he went and talked to the person who was being fired, whose job had just been saved. And then later he came to me and said, well, you know, I told the worker when I was talking to him, I pretended to be on the Chinese side because he needs to learn that some things need to be done a certain way. Otherwise, they don't fulfill the Chinese uh, working standards. And so I pretend to be on the Chinese side so that he learns a lesson. But obviously, I'm on his side. So this was a quite an interesting representation for me of the type of contradictions that are also inside and obviously embedded within Bonnie's own position as a broker, which is out of necessity, but at the same time, it involves a series of quite complex calculations in terms of how to socially mediate and negotiate quite important things, such as someone's entire employment and livelihood, right? But he's also financially incentivized to try and keep that worker on the job, because if that worker goes, he loses money, correct? And now, Bunny will not be losing money in that sense. But obviously, uh, you know, part of his role as a broker is also that of being, you know, part of a broader group of having both Kenyan workers and Chinese workers being able to talk to him. And his position as a broker, the fact he can solve issues, does bring him financial incentives in terms of being able to negotiate salary increases for himself. So it's obviously not directly correlated with the fact whether this one worker gets fired, but it is correlated in perhaps it's related to his own salary. Uh, These increases are quite minor, but I think his social status within the labor relations in the construction site is mainly what is at stake, as well as, of course, the fact that he does care about the workers that are in his area. Quick question about the composition of the labor force that you saw at LAMU. Again, I mentioned at the top of the show that U.S. Secretary of State, dating all the way back to Hillary Clinton in 2010 or 11, have really used this idea that the Chinese import workers to Africa to work on construction projects. This is something that Professor Carlos Oya and uh, Weiwei Chen at the University of London back in 2019 dispelled, looking at research in Angola and Ethiopia. Barry Soutman and Yen Hai Rong from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology many years ago also found that local labor content on Chinese construction sites was in the 80 to 90 percent. And in fact, local labor content across the continent from research on Chinese construction sites has been one that is in the 80 to 90 percent in most countries. Some countries where there is very hard to find people, they, it goes down in the 70 percent. Kenya is an interesting case because there's an ample workforce on the standard gauge railway. Again, the research came out, almost all local labor content except for skilled positions. What was your observation at the Port of Lamu in terms of were there Chinese workers pushing wheelbarrows, as they say, unskilled Chinese workers, or was all the unskilled jobs, were they being done by locals? Yes, at the time I was there in February, March 2019, there were around 1,200 workers in the construction site. Around 1,000 of them were Kenyan workers, and the remaining were Chinese workers. There had been a fluctuation in the sense that at the beginning of the project, there were more uh, more than 200 Chinese workers, but then these had phased out once the sort of setting up part of the job had been completed. As per contractual condition, 75% of labor had to be local. So this was slightly above the contractual agreement. 
between the Kenyan government and the Chinese company. But uh, obviously, it's not just a question of quantity of jobs available. It's also, obviously, as you mentioned, a question of quality. And out of the workers, the skilled labor was Chinese. But unskilled labor was local, right? Or were there unskilled Chinese workers there too? No. So the unskilled labor was local labor. And there was also different levels of skills within that. So there's people who train on the job, you know, within three days and they do what is unskilled labor in the construction site. There are some things that require more training on perhaps previous skills like operating cranes and operating machinery. Those were also jobs that were being done by local workers, but they were still considered like technically unskilled, right? But so it's training that they probably received in the past in other construction sites. And this is a trend that I observed in the fact that those on the higher spectrum of salary and uh, operating machinery were usually, had usually worked for other construction, Chinese construction sites or for Japanese contractors. Mandira, in the bigger context of how construction is evolving in, in Africa, obviously, you know, the Chinese contractors remain very strong players. There's a res- somewhat of a resurgence from some Western actors to move back into a, an infrastructure space in Africa. But also what we're really seeing is the emergence of a whole set of other global South contractors, you know, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, India, like similar kind of actors kind of moving into that space. So in looking at the Chinese experience and the Kenyan Chinese experience, you know, around these kind of large scale construction sites, what kind of conclusions are you drawing around how we should think about South-South relationships in the construction sector in Africa? That's definitely a question I think, you know, you could have a good cup of tea discussing. You know, the short answer is, as we know, every region or every country has different labor practices, different forms of labor governance. And I think when you have an entity from, let's say, China operating in a country such as Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, what have you, to see how they kind of work practices and labor practices are I think imported and to a sense embedded or attempts to embed it is, I think, what's interesting. And I think, I mean, I don't follow the kind of construction market or kind of very closely, but I think looking at, say, the political economy or the economic of construction, you know, I think especially zoning in on Kenya and Kenya's construction industry, it kind of reflects a significant change in employment practices in the global construction sector. You know, there's kind of reduced permanent labor forces and more kind of this use of temporary workers. And what I've read in the literature, especially in the global south, is this kind of supplying companies, especially uh, in the informal kind of setup, is with kind of these construction gangs that are headed by kind of a construction gang leader that, you know, will will kind of do the work of gathering laborers, you know, setting up kind of deals between the contractor and the laborers and kind of serve as the kind of recruiter, so to speak, and sometimes supervisor for these kind of construction, at, at say, construction gangs. And I think in the global south, that's been practiced or this this practice is quite common and it's been seen in, observed in India, Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, Nepal. I also think in South America, in, in Mexico, in Brazil. So I think there can be commonalities can be drawn, but also differences can be drawn across different construction markets and industries in the global south. And I think it's definitely, as you said, you know, observing the entry of Turkey, India as well, it would be good to get to do a more kind of a wider kind of or a comparative case study of, let's say, Chinese construction companies and that of Turkish construction companies and how they go about engaging with local labor and seeing, you know, what are the commonalities and differences. Let's close our discussion reflecting back on the chapter and the research that you did. I had a difficult time when I finished the chapter trying to think if the contribution of Chinese construction companies to things like what's going on in Lamu is a net positive or it's a net negative, because it seemed to be a very complex mix of both. On the one hand, infrastructure is getting built, but on the other hand, there are these 
very, very deep-seated asymmetrical segregations and injustices and almost a, a certain degree of, of discrimination that exists within the hierarchies in these construction sites that make it kind of, ooh, that doesn't feel like it's very positive. And it doesn't feel like there's a lot of skills transfer that's going on. And it makes me wonder that two or three decades now into the modern Chinese engagement in Africa era, we don't see a stronger role for Kenyan construction companies who should be doing a lot of this work or Namibian or in other countries. For example, in South Africa, the Chinese don't do any construction because South African construction firms are quite robust. So could you help us understand at the end of this chapter, at the end of your research, what should we take away from this complex relationship that both of you explored? That's a very good question. I think what one observes, even zooming out of the case of Blamu, it is a very difficult context in terms of skill, skill training, skill transfer, technology transfer. It's something that uh, has been looked at a lot in the literature as well, and it's very difficult to see the results of this skill transfer, whether it has happened. Overall, I think it's quite clear, uh, as others like Ding Fei have said, to see that the construction boom, the China-led construction boom, has really done very little to integrate African contractors into this China-led infrastructure network. In terms of providing job opportunities, this is, of course, I imagine, very welcome in any context in terms of increasing employment. I feel one of the points that perhaps I don't think we've had much space in the, even in the chapter to explore is this idea of then who is being hired and so putting closer look in terms of whether local content regulations are being fulfilled, both in terms of personnel, but also materials. And at the same time, ensuring that there is a much more nuanced understanding of what local content means. Because if the requirement is, for example, to have 75% Kenyan labor, anyone with a Kenyan citizenship is a local worker in the eyes of the contract and the Chinese company. However, when these infrastructure are being built in perhaps historically marginalized regions of a country or politically um, areas where there's a strong political opposition, this can also create tensions because populations indigenous to the regions are feeling like they're not reaping the benefits. And this, it becomes very difficult to then change the contract once it's been signed. So I think sort of take away for me is the fact that there is a question to be answered on whether skill training and technology transfer is actually taking place. And from my research and observations, the answer is not really. And on the other hand, I um, uh, request the need from host governments to be much more specific in terms of what they need and want to get out of this type of agreements with Chinese construction companies. I think the case reflects almost like this microcosm or I, I think it's, it's reflective of China-Africa relations at large and specifically the asymmetrical kind of power balance between the two regions. And specifically, I think it also speaks to questions, you know, the role of African agency Specifically, you know, the government or the Kenyan government, as Ellie mentioned, you know, it was this project was kind of dr is driven by the kind of the, the Kenyan government. So, you know, what was their role in advocating for labor standards or specifically or specific salary, you know, brackets to be agreed? Like, I think we need to also question African agency around, um, you know, how are African governments first we allow. African governments are allowing uh, foreign entities and companies to come and build infrastructure, to make use of local labor. But what kind of checks and balances are they putting in place to ensure, you know, that these entities are adhering to national labor practices or local labor practices and avoiding the exploitation of workers and things? So I think the takeaway I, I kind of take here is the need to kind of bring in more of like a exploration or examination of the role of African governments or whether that be at a local or national level in um, kind of promoting the interests of their laborers. The book is Africa's Global Infrastructure, South-South Transformations in Practice. You can actually go and get it 
on Amazon. It's releasing on Wednesday, May 1st. And Kobus, I always say this every time we have a book written by a bunch of academics. This one is actually affordable. $30 is the paper book. $19 is the Kindle. It's not these absurd $300 for a book prices that are out there. You're going to want to forward when you get the book, and I do encourage you to go get it. Go to chapter seven, and you're going to see this wonderful chapter on a global sense of workplace, labor relations in Sino-African construction sites by Mandira Bagwandin, who's a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town, and Elisa Gambino, a Hallsworth Fellow in Political Economy at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester, who did all that exciting fieldwork in Kenya at Lamu. Mandira, Elisa, congratulations again on the chapter and the contribution to this discussion that is so important and one that I have a feeling 10 years from now we're still going to be talking about, but it's really important to have these conversations today, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having us. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thanks, Kobus. It's been great. Kobus, so interesting and so exciting for us to have this conversation again, going all the way back. It brings me back to 2010, 2011, when we were talking about these same things. But let me put you in the role of president or prime minister of a country in Africa. And by the way, this could be a country anywhere. Okay, your legislature has given you money now to build a port, a railroad, something. Okay, you have two years to get it done. So the Chinese will come up with a bid that says, we will get it done in a year and a half. We will bring in our own suppliers. We will bring in our own managerial talent. We'll work with brokers to get local labor and bam, we're done, right? Or do you hire local firms that may not have had as much experience building large-scale infrastructure the way the Chinese have, but you're contributing to your local economy more. You are diverting those funds domestically and not to, to foreign suppliers like the Chinese. Your political future, in many respects, is on the line, depending on whether or not you can deliver this big piece of infrastructure. And let me remind you that it is not easy to deliver this infrastructure. I sit in a city here in Ho Chi Minh City where they started a subway 12 years ago. And it still is not done. Okay, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, what do you do? This is a tough question, but I think the direction I would go in, but I, I can imagine I, I would hit a lot, of, a lot of barriers, but the direction I would go in would be a kind of a hybrid between the two, where the project is run by the Chinese, but one is an interventionist African government in the sense that one sets up some kind of mechanism for more formal, more Im implemented training of the local companies, whatever you select a group of local companies and you kind of embed them with the Chinese and then you hunt among your you know kind of recent graduates from China, your African students who, who had been studying in China to set up a translation and interpreting team to kind of to facilitate the interactions between the two. That would be roughly my approach, but I can foresee many people pushing back, particularly the Chinese who would be who would be saying like look this is gonna this is gonna slow everything down it's going to make everything very complicated. This is not how we do business. So I can imagine that that it would get a lot of pushback. But I think this kind of proactive kind of in the first place, you know, kind of just just drawing on the chapter, and knowing how complicated the work is being made through language barriers. I mean, that that's the first thing. But then also to just be very cognizant of the need for once that project is done, it's not enough for the company to just pack up and leave and take all the skills with them. There has to be skills that stay in Africa. And that kind of just has to be the bottom line, I think, for African governments. And that, of course, makes things a lot more complicated, but it also, that's the, the kind of key to making them more valuable, I think. Well, of course, the irony here was, and this is something that Professor Deborah Braudigam talks about in her book, what was it, The Dragon's Gift? Was that the book? From, that was the first one, yes. That was the first one, yeah. And she talks a lot about the skills transfers in the 70s and 80s by the Japanese to China and how the Chinese later in the 80s and 90s required all the joint ventures and foreign engagements and foreign partnerships to, they mandated skills transfers. So this is a topic, by the way, that the Chinese are intimately familiar with because they themselves in many ways perfected it, but yet don't necessarily do that when they go abroad. The problem is that I can foresee is that the Chinese would say, sure, no problem. 
we're going to do more skills transfer. We'll get those graduates. We'll set up institutes. But it's going to take more time and more money to do your project. Yeah, I can totally imagine. And, and probably for a good reason. You know, it, it, it is, and for good yeah. reason. And that's where I can imagine that coming back to domestic politics, that a lot of those folks in the legislature or in the factions that control the money for this infrastructure say, you know what, I don't really care. I just want to get this road done or I just want to get this bridge done. That's my biggest priority because I'm going to run and my power base is going to be impacted by whether or not I deliver this infrastructure. Definitely. I mean, I can definitely see that. And, and I think that is the calculus among many African decision makers. On the counterpoint, I would say that integrating this kind of local stakeholdership more and being able to setting up something where there's more skills transfer and better communication will probably end up saving time in the short term by, by just avoiding kind of labor disputes and, and local community disputes, which we've also seen is a big problem on Chinese work sites. But in the slightly longer term, it will buy you, you know, kind of, it will have political payoff, particularly if, if one is, you know, kind of, if that site, that work site happens to be in some kind of, some kind of voting community where, you know, kind of where you can demonstrate, you know, for example, local employment benefits. So, you know, so, so it's not necessarily that the benefits and the costs are not only one side they kind of happen on both sides depending on you know which whichever one of the approaches one takes but yeah like i like i can definitely see that it would probably slow down proceedings so we've talked a lot about the linguistic deficiencies of the chinese managers but we didn't talk as much about the cultural deficiencies as well and if you read and write chinese or read chinese at least wechat is an absolute gold mine for first person narratives about what it's like for Chinese construction managers to work in Africa. It's amazing how many people just go up onto WeChat groups and share their experiences in these very open, almost diary style posts that they write. And one of the things that you see consistently in post after post, and I've been looking at these for years, is that a lot of the managers coming to Africa from China are coming from very rural parts of China where they've not only not had any experience outside the country, they've not had much experience outside their own province or township. And so many of them are very unsophisticated about cross-cultural management. And I think that also plays into it that they just have no experience in how to deal with people from such diverse backgrounds when they arrive in countries in Africa. But also, again, this is the same challenge in Latin America, the Middle East, Central Asia. We've been talking all week about workers in Pakistan, given the violence that's been afflicting Chinese workers there. And so that, I think, is also another part of it. But the interesting part of that, Cobus, which is also a parallel to this, is that there is a whole culture of Chinese managers now who've spent the past 20 years working all over the world building infrastructure. And we talk about that in the context of the U.S. and Europe now that want to start building infrastructure in places like Africa and in the Americas, where there isn't a whole class of people who have experience working in frontier countries in the, some of the most difficult circumstances and environments you can possibly imagine to be architects and project managers and civil engineers. We don't have those people readily available. In fact, we have labor shortages in most of Europe, Japan, and the United States for those jobs. And so the Chinese have this whole class of people who've spent decades now working in these environments, but oftentimes many of them are culturally illiterate when it comes to the particular country that they're working in. And I think that's a very big problem as well. It's a really big problem because it also feeds into kind of unhelpful narratives, I think, on both sides or a lack of communication, particularly around labor issues. You know, so as Elisa and, and Mandira were mentioning, there is this this whole cult of eating bitter, this idea of like, you know, of overcoming hardship, you know, kind of and, and, and a very strongly embedded narrative within China about how Chinese people overcome hardship for success, right? And that in, in lots of ways is true. It really reflects how unpleasant a lot of that is. But it is also self-romanticizing in, in really key ways. And what it doesn't show, and what I, and I think they, they were really smart in their chapter to kind of point that out, is that, you know, the eating bitter narrative now comes with a very strong payoff, right? Kind of like you eat bitter for a while and then you actually, particularly in places like Africa, and then that actually 
like you know speeds up your advancement up the ladder you know by by moving to say you do one one project in africa then like as as one person they were saying like then move to sri lanka and then finally move to china and actually so so kind of up you know up that kind of hierarchy that is not true for african workers you know so so chinese narratives of eating bitter is useless in the african labor context because these workers are not moving up anyway right kind of like they, they are they are stuck structurally and you know kind of so structurally stuck that they can't even free Really work from one end of the work site to the other if they wanted to. You know, so in that sense, from an African perspective, these labor systems seem, even though they, they are run by other people, in lots of structural ways, they seem straight out of colonial times, right? Kind of like, and, and, and with that, these kind of structural ideas of like, you are a certain person, and that means you can't move up beyond a certain level. Those are two very valid and very powerful labor narratives, right? But they are not narrating with each other they're not communicating with each other the two narratives are never really put into communication with each other and questioning each other um, and i think that is a great example of the lapses and the limits of chinese kind of infrastructure provision in africa this kind of chinese economic engagement in africa is transformative in some ways but in other ways it's really not and um you know kind of an, and there i think we need to have a, a much kind of more robust conversation well, let's just be very clear here that that very strict Chinese work ethic of eating bitter and those tough hours, those long hours, seven days a week, there's a lot of resistance to that in China where people are rebelling, particularly young people, against the 996 culture, which is you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. And in fact, there's a whole movement now called the Lying Flat Movement or Tangping where people and particularly young people, are just revolting against this type of abuse and these brutal hours. It also should be noted, and I used to work in China, and I experienced for a brief period this tough, tough culture where they call you at 1.30 in the morning and say, I need something done on, this is 1.30 on Saturday morning, and you have to get it done by 9 o'clock Sunday morning. And you think to yourself, this is not efficient or effective in terms of productivity. And so all of these extra hours that they push don't necessarily lead to better outcomes. And that is being pushed back in China domestically. So what we're seeing in many of the frustrations that we see in African countries about working under Chinese managerial conditions are also being resisted back home as well. I think that's just important context to, to put there. How have you looked at this issue over the past 15, 20 years and how it's evolved? Do you think that we've made any progress with it, or is the conversation that we had today the same conversation we had in 2011? I think there's been some advances. I think we now think a lot more critically around the broader conversation of, of governance around these things. I think a lot more critically about worker welfare and about community welfare around work sites. I think that conversation has, has moved forward a lot. There's also, we've also seen the birth of an entire scholarly conversation trying to kind of work out what African agency actually means, you know, kind of in, in this context. What a lot of that has shown is kind of real lapses and real problems on the side of African governments, um, both local governments and national governments. And that, I think, those lapses are old, right? Kind of, so we, we've been living with them since 2011 and long before that. And so, so to a certain extent, those problems are still the same, but I think the way we talk about them, have, we, we've gained some tools, I think, to analyze them. But in lots of ways, those are not necessarily being echoed on the African managerial side. I don't know that for all of the African complaints around these issues, I don't know that African governments have become more hard-nosed or more or that much more hard-nosed or that or particularly have developed that that many more tools to particularly kind of deal with these problems. You know, in a lot of ways, I think the problems are still quite similar. But I think the way we talk about them, the way we understand them, and the way we kind of analyze them have moved forward so it's a somewhat un unsatisfying situation i think unsatisfying but at least there's some progress and that is encouraging in that sense and this discussion that it's happening and that there's books like this that are still coming out is also very encouraging as well because it's a really important topic chinese construction is still very very omnipresent throughout africa despite the slowdown in chinese lending 
Chinese contracts, EPC contracts, these are the projects that are being done and funded by either the World Bank or by host governments, and the Chinese contractors themselves are doing it, is still very important, though. So even Chinese policy bank lending has gone down, and we're not seeing things like the Standard Gauge Railway anymore. As Elisa pointed out, the Port of Lamu was financed by the Kenyans and constructed by the Chinese. Same with the Standard Gauge Railway in Tanzania, paid for by Tanzania, built by at least one part of it by the Chinese, and many General Electric projects. These are private companies that are outsourced to Chinese contractors in Africa as well. So it's very, very much a timely and relevant issue, and we're so glad that Mandira and Elisa were able to join us to shed some light on that. Kobus, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the show. Let's leave it there. If you'd like to join this kind of conversation every single day and you really want to understand what the Chinese are doing in Africa and other parts of the Global South, then you're going to want to subscribe to China Global South and also just to get our daily newsletter, to try our AI engine, to see our exclusive videos for subscribers and join our global community of readers. We serve more than 25 governments. We have many of the top universities in the world that subscribe to us. So if you want to be part of what they are reading, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. You'll get one month for free. We've made rates very, very affordable, so it's accessible to everybody. And if you are a student or a teacher, you can email me directly, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I'll email you half off links for subscriptions monthly and annual are both available. Please do use your academic email when you send that to me. So we'll leave it there. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afriquechine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.